OK, so welcome everyone to the uh, first virtual meeting of the Northwest C++ users group. Um, I was thinking earlier this week there was a small irony. This is the basically this was the first time in at least that I can remember that we've actually had a real problem with rooms. I don't remember if, or don't know if everybody remembers the chaos with the rooms at the end of uh, last year, which we got resolved. And it's also we, the first time we've actually canceled two meetings that I can ever remember, once for snow and once for COVID. And now we're virtual, so we don't even need a meeting room. Um, <laughs> the irony of that's just a little crazy. Uh, on that note, however, we are also, um, Microsoft has closed the reactor room for May and June as of today. Uh, thanks, Robin, for getting that information to me. We will continue to meet here for the next two months, at least. So uh, we'll kind of figure out how this goes and so forth. Uh, Brett, did you want to say anything about um, CPPCon or any of that yet? Sure. Um, yes, this is a great opportunity. And uh, I have advertised us on CPP Lang, so hopefully we get uh, people from all over the world to be able to join this meeting. So this is great. I'm very happy about that. We are uh, still planning for CPPCon to happen in September. So if you have any thoughts on some ideas to, um, to help with grow the uh, conference, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, we do have a Slack channel. I can send that out to you through the announcements later. But uh, yeah, we, we are still planning to go forward with CPPCon. So put it on your calendar. OK, with that, we will turn it over to Dan. What's his name? Yeah. Hi. And uh, go for it. All right. Well, greetings, everybody. and. Uh, welcome to everyone out there in TV land. Um, sorry there's no pizza tonight. I did try to contact Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, but uh, they're both self-isolating, so we're out of luck. Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you uh, some thoughts about teaching C++ to students in the applied sciences versus computer science. Um, and well, as, as many of you know, I'll explain this a little bit later, but um, I do teach this in the context of computational finance. But my idea here is um, to lay out, to present what I teach. I'm not saying it's the greatest thing in the world, but it's just an idea that I thought I'd present. Um, and uh, But keep keeping in mind that this could actually be uh, there, there's a lot of common material that actually could apply to other areas of science and engineering. Okay. Um, but first, uh, I've, I've not done this before with a presentation, but thought I would dedicate it to the crew of Apollo 13 and the members of Mission Control who got our astronauts back home safely as 50 years ago this month and if, in fact this week. So failure is not an option. All right, so a little background um, on my course. So this is a single quarter, 10 week course in C++ for master's students in our computational finance program at the University of Washington. Um, our emphasis is on applications. So using C++ to actually program models and solve problems. Now, the idea I have here is that about, I would say about 90% of this material I think would be transferable to other areas of applied sciences and engineering. And in addition, as we all know, C++ is orders of magnitude more efficient than Python, but using modern C++, it's arguably, I've not done any tests on this, but um, just again, from my own experience, um, I would posit that it's almost as rapid to develop a lot of applications and models 
if we stick to modern C++. Um, as for the course, I'm currently in the sixth year of teaching this, so um, I just completed my uh, sixth time around uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay, um, I have a set of companion lecture notes um, for this course called C++ for the rest of us. I'm st it's still in draft mode. I'm, I'm working on it, though I'd like to get it to a point where I could actually release it to the public on GitHub, um, but you can probably guess where I got the inspiration for the title. Um, okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, this course is, I considered it a, an introductory slash intermediate course. And I consider it introductory in the sense that we cover a lot of the same things that you would see in, a, in, an, in an introductory C++ course. So the fundamentals, object-oriented programming, templates, and STL containers and algorithms. At the, in, in the intermediate sense, though, all of our students have some prior programming experience. So we don't have to spend a lot of time um, discussing what a function is, what an if statement is, and so forth. So we go through things such as functions, um, conditional branching, and iteration <clears throat> very quickly. So it's just a case of taking what they know and showing them how to do it in C++. Um, we also talk about open source C++ mathematical libraries, something that you probably would not find in an introductory course. And so by the end of the quarter, um, students are able to, you know, I would say, implement some fairly sophisticated mathematical routines and models. Um, and it's not, we're not talking PhD level or anything, but um, they're getting a lot of horsepower, I think. And from there, then they can extend it to whatever they need. Um, as for goals in the course, of course, uh, proficiency in implementing common mathematical models. Um, our emphasis, again, is on modern C++. At present, this is through C++ 17. C++ 20, of course, is, well, supposed to come out this year. so. I'm not sure at what point I will start this, if I'll be ready, and if the, the compilers will be ready by um, next year around this time, but we'll see. But when that does happen, it's probably going to be a pretty major overhaul <laughs> for this course. But anyway, um, as I said, the emphasis is on, on modern C++, so that means using no-cost abstractions when we can. I do put this in quotes because arguably they might not be exactly no cost, but if not, they're pretty dang close. Um, we don't want to reinvent stuff that we already have in the language and in the library. And one of the big things is I don't want to discourage students with gratuitously complicated code or talking about legacy C. Um, I've actually found that a lot of C++ courses at the same level, just looking at, at syllabi and talking with students who come into our graduate program, having had undergraduate program uh, courses in C++, is that this is one thing that happens, is that they spend a lot of time talking about C in a C++ course. Um, in fact, I talked with an online student today um, who was looking at a course at a another university, and it explicitly says C++ 9803. There's nothing in there on modern C++. And one of our um, major competitors in financial engineering, um, again, because other students have taken it before they come into our program, um, they've told me that the lecture notes have not been updated since uh, 2001. Okay. So, what we try to do is really use and goose modern C++ as much as we can for practical work 
while busting the myth that the language is somehow too difficult. Okay, things that we don't care about. Again, the C language, it is not a prerequisite. Um, furthermore, when it comes to strings, we will use std string, not char star. We'll use std vector, not dynamic C arrays. And the one thing that I tell them during the class is this from a, a reference book that I use sometimes, where um, that using a dynamic C array when vector will do is like clicking your fingernails with a chainsaw. We also do not care about minute details about strings and output formatting because this is a computational course. So we, first of all, care more about numerical results. Plus, in practice, at least in financial engineering, the results are not going to be output to the console. They're going to be output to some interface or to Excel um, and what have you. So we don't spend a lot of time um, you know, getting all the details of streams and uh, C out formatting down. Um, we also don't care about the wide variety of numerical types in C++. In order to get on with the work, we are mainly concerned with double precision and integers. Um, we also deal with size T and long where necessary. Um, in addition, we do not care about memory allocation with new and delete. We have stood unique pointer now. So for the types of applications that, again, that we're concerned with, we really don't need new and delete anymore. Um, I do, however, talk about it during the last week because you know, for other um, work, they may, they may need to know about it. But as far as programming models and so forth, we avoid it. Um, we also don't spend any time on implementing our own sort or search algorithms or doubly linked lists because available in the standard library. So we use what we have. Um, and as far as lists go, we use std vector 99% of the time anyway. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go week by week. And um, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not gonna go into every detail that we cover each week, but this is you know just kind of an overview of of what we cover. Okay, so I start out with a brief history of C++, and for this I use John Kalb's book, um, The Beast is Back, and students are assigned to read it as well as watch a video of a lecture that he did on the topic. Unfortunately, as far as I can as far as I know, the one from CPPCon is not available. Uh, if I'm wrong, please let me know because that would be the one I'd like for them to watch. So we start with uh, creator himself, Bjarne Easterstra, and um, then we talk about the heyday around the turn of the century um, when C++ was really the language of choice, um, especially in quantitative finance. Um, but then we move on to the period of stagnation and the emergence of Java, and then the resurrection, again, is discussed in John's book and the post-2011 world, which is where we really um, concentrate our efforts. Um, we also look at setting up a project in an IDE. I do prefer Visual Studio 2019, but it's a fact of life that a lot of students um, will have Macs, so we also have to deal with the Clang compiler and Xcode. On occasion, we'll have a student who uses Linux, um, but for the most part, we're able to get by. Um, so I show them how to build a simple executable, you know, good old hello world, and uh, we talk about compiler warnings and errors. And one thing I do emphasize here is not to ignore warnings because they can easily become errors. In addition, um, of course, again, being a math course, um, 
we start talking about the math very early. Um, again, the numerical variables we mainly care about are int and double. We talk about the basic math operators and then the mathematical functions in C math. And here again, I'm, I do emphasize that they need to use, they, they need to hash include C math and then scope any of the um, mathematical functions that are included. So I, I, as I recall, Visual Studio actually by default includes all of the C math functions in the global namespace. Um, but other compilers might not. And so in order to keep our code standard, um, this is a, a point of emphasis and they'll get their homework marked, um, marked down if they don't do this. We then move very quickly into user defined functions. So you see we're, we're in week one and we're already talking about functions. Um, so that includes the declaration and implementation. And then students write their own functions using the math functions that are available in CMath. Moving on to week two, um, we are already talking about classes and objects. So the usual uh, class versus objects, the example I like to use is a car is a class and a Dino Ferrari 308 GT4 and a Honda Accord are objects. So one on the left is my dream car. The one on the right is the car we own. But uh, I, the one on the right is certainly a heck of a lot more reliable. Um, so we, the emphasis at this point is how to use a class and what a class does. So we look at variables, member functions, and we also talk about UML class diagrams, for example, with the car. So we give them the example of a, a car class, what it has, so attributes, wheels, engine, and so forth, and what it does. In other words, the member functions, so move forward, stop, turn, brake, so forth. Okay. So again, at this stage, in, in, week, in week two, our focus is on how to use and instantiate existing classes. So I use std string as an example. So what it means to create an instance, call and use the, the public member functions, for example, at size and pushback. Um, and then this is somewhat handy because we get CL containers in a few weeks after this. And so they already have a little exposure to these functions that they will see again. Um, we also then cover conditional and iterative statements. So the usual if, else, if, else, switch statements, for and while loops. Um, but again, we are, you know, this is week two. And because students have already seen this in other languages, we're able to move through this very quickly. Um, in addition, in week two, we talk about arrays, um, but we stick with the standard lab. So std array, talk about a little bit, but we move on very quickly to std vector, which will be our container of choice throughout the course. Um, again, we don't care about dynamic C-style arrays. Um, we also talk about function overloading, as well as aliases. This includes the using keyword, um, preferring using over type def, although um, they're expected to know what type def is. Um, and we cover L value references, although at this point, don't tell them that they're L value references. Um, we also talk about pointers, but um, this is only, at this stage, it's only two variables on the stack. We don't talk about um, heap memory allocation or anything like that. And the reason that they are here is because we'll soon need them to discuss the this pointer and STL iterators. So my philosophy here is a just-in-time approach. So it's as things are needed, I will introduce them. Um, so if we didn't have the this pointer or STL containers, I probably wouldn't talk about pointers at all until we got to unique pointers, but we, we need them uh, quite soon after this. 
Moving on to week three, um, we start covering user-defined classes. And um, a very nice example that I found is in Yosudis's old object-oriented programming in C++ book. Um, I think this came out around 2002, 03. Um, and it's, um, I found back when it was a really, really good book to learn from, but um, I actually talked to uh, the author at CPPCon a couple of years ago and asked him if he was going to update it, but unfortunately he said no. Um, if there were a, a, an updated version, I would probably use it for this class. But anyway, what we do is we take, it's a fraction class example. So um, I borrowed the idea, although I modified it to a certain extent. But what, what we do is we incrementally build up a defined class. Um, first, we start with um, private integer members for numerator and denominator and public accessors and mutators for each. We then look at overloaded constructors. So a constructor that takes in two integers for numerator and denominator, one integer, which is the numerator, and the denominator defaults to one, and a default constructor, which defaults to zero. Um, we also talk about the meaning of this pointer. And then going back to both the constructors and um, the mutator class or mutator function for the denominator, we need to check for zero in the denominator. And so very quickly, we start talking about refactoring code. So we actually refactor this into a separate private member so that the checking doesn't have to be done in both the mutator and in the constructor. So, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little ahead of myself there. Okay, but this is, again, this is a point that I, I stress very heavily in the class is about refactoring code and avoiding the duplication of code. Excuse me, I'll take a little swig of my coffee here. Okay, so moving on with the fraction class, again, we're incrementally building this up. So the next step is to implement operators. So as examples, I use multiplication and multiplication assignment. And since we also would want to simplify our fraction after multiplying it, um, we show then again a private simplifying function that can be used not just for multiplication, but later for other operations. And for this, we start looking at some of the new um, convenient math functions in C++ 17, for example, GCD for greatest common denominator. <clears throat> um, then I also show them how to implement the inequality operator, as well as equality and non-equality, and the prefix and postfix increment operators. Um, then we also talk about using the this pointer as well as returning um, the dereferenced this. And at this stage, we also talk about functors and um, add one to this class. And functors are for math, excuse me, as you might imagine, are very, very cool and very, very useful. So um, this is an, another point throughout the class that I, I stress a lot is, is using functors. Okay, so uh, just to show you an example here, this is the declaration file of the last iteration of the fraction example. It's, just, it's called fraction four. So as you can see, we have, it's four steps to get here. Um, I'm sorry, in the, in the slides that if you downloaded them, I know this print is small. Um, when we tested out this online setup, we were having some problems. Um, fitting everything in, and the, for some reason the display was cutting off at the top, so I kind of concentrated things and shrunk them down, but um, apparently things are, I was told earlier, it was uh, displaying normally now. But 
Anyway, I think you should be able to see that at least on your screen pretty well. And then for a week three assignment, what I do then is I have the students take the fraction class that you just saw and then fill in the, the remaining operators that we would typically need on a class. So that would include addition, subtraction, and the related uh, combination assignment operators. And here they can <clears throat> they get to use the least common multiple function in the standard library again from C17. So, you know, I really try to again, you know, use the most recent developments so that they don't have to do this work on their own. They can just get right to it, you know, kind of like Python, right? Okay. Um, and then also division and um, division assignment. Um, they also complete the remaining inequality operators. And as you may recall, I showed them how to implement prefix and postfix increment so they get to do the decrement version. And there's some other member functions that they need to um, declare and implement on their own. Going into week four, we now hit the basics of object-oriented programming, namely inheritance and composition. So to start with inheritance, of course, virtual functions, um, I do tell them that they need to put a virtual default destructor on the base class. Now, this is where I have to dance around a little bit because I haven't talked explicitly about new and delete. So I'm, as I said, I dance around it a little bit. Later on, it will make more sense. But at this stage, I just tell them because of other things that and other ways that people might use your class to avoid memory leaks, you need to include this. We then, of course, talk about uh, the virtual keyword and override in um, modern C++. And I'm, this is another point of emphasis to use override as a best practice. Um, we talk about the order of instantiation and destruction. That's, of course, a really good interview question, so I do cover that. But our emphasis is really on using abstract base interface classes, so pure, pure virtual functions only, and then we just restrict to one level of derivation down. And for a lot of modeling, this is perfectly sufficient. Again, this is from just based on my own experience as a, a quant developer. And of course, we know best practices are moving away from uh, long inheritance chains anyway. So um, this I just keep it pretty much at this level. Um, I do, however, talk about the pitfalls of extended inheritance chains. So um, the hit to performance and um, how they can invite uh, basically invite bugs. And again, I can say that from a lot of experience. Um, we then move on to dynamic polymorphism. And um, the example coming up will show you um, how they learn that in, in a way that's relevant to math. So they do this in an assignment. And what they do is they use inheritance and dynamic polymorphism for finding the root of a single variable function. And so what they do, and again, this is very nice from a mathematical point of view. You know, math is based on a lot of abstraction. So they have an abstract concept of a real valued function. And so it's, um, it's, uh, what's a good word for it? Um, the instructions are contained in the base class, namely through a virtual operator, which is essentially a function of a single real variable. And then <clears throat> they need to implement several derived concrete classes, for example, a polynomial, um, a function with the log in it, and then again with the just in time idea, it's at this stage where I introduce stood numeric limits because 
as X gets close to B, um, we start to hit a singularity. And so <clears throat> what I show them is, is actually it's a trick from Boost. And they use the square root of epsilon to essentially represent zero. So if X minus B in absolute value is less than the square root the square root of epsilon, then that's treated as being zero, and in which case the function would return um, the infinity function. The quiet not a number function is used actually in the numerical routine itself, as we will see. Um, and then I some I'll give them something that um, a, a function that involves trigonometric. Uh, functions. Okay, so they've written their um, their um, inherited classes from the abstract base class. So that's done. So the next step is is that they need to write a function which implements a standard root mining, root finding method from numerical analysis, um, I usually use the secant method because it doesn't involve coding up derivatives. And what this will do is it will take in an abstract base object as const reference in its argument, and then it will, at runtime, using runtime polymorphism, um, take in whatever derived function object comes through and compute the, the nearest route that it can find based on the initial guesses and so forth. So um, looking at the, this is just a look at an implementation of the, um, the secant method. And so you can see, let's see if I can get my, get my laser pointer. So up here, um, it's going to take in this, uh, the function as a const reference to the base class, the initial guesses, a tolerance level, and then a maximum number of iterations. And so if, if it converges, then it's going to return the root that is convergence is found um, before the maximum number of iterations is hit. If not, then it's going to return not a number as defined by quiet not a number. There may be other ways to do this. It's just the way um, I've set it up. But I, I know that there are other NAN representations in the standard library. OK. But um, again, the, the key concept here from a mathematical point of view is the real function for which we seek the root is easily represented by a function object. And this secant method at runtime doesn't care which derived object it is. Okay. Then moving on, we start talking about composition um, between a containing object and a member object, and we do this in a way to avoid object copy. Now, believe it or not, this may seem like a, a very trivial point to many of you, but in my experience before we had um, move semantics, this actually could be a, a bit of a pain in the arse. And um, because there was a, an argument between should we have full control over the member variable as an object, or is it OK to store it as a reference? And with the, with the trade-off being the hit that you take with the object copy. Um, typically, though, as long as the software architects didn't um, pitch a fit about it, um, before C++11, um, what we would do is pass in the object in the constructor as a const L value reference and then store it as a const reference on the containing object. So this would avoid object copy, but of course it's not flexible. So first of all is lacking control, of course, over the lifetime of the member variable, but also you can't modify it 
um, once the uh, containing object is initialized, nor can we copy the containing object. Okay. So, um, but in practice, again, back when I was a quant developer, um, this was usually perfectly acceptable because in the types of applications I worked on, it was, I mean, you would have to try really, really hard um, to make the, um, the member object go out of scope before the containing object would. I realize there are plenty of other applications across the spectrum in C++ where you would not want to do this, but for most mathematical code, this would work. However, we can do better now with C++11, and we can pass the, um, the member variable object into the constructor by our value reference and or by, by move and store the actual object as an R value reference. And not to restate the obvious, but now the containing object has full control over the member object lifetime, and it can be modified after the containing object is constructed. In addition, we can take a deep copy of the containing object by default. Okay, so um, I use a fun little example here, keeping with our space program theme. So we look at an Apollo moon landing mission. So the containing object will be the Apollo mission and it will have a command module and a lunar module object. So in case one, we store each of these as an L value reference. And in the second case, we will um, pass these objects by with move semantics and then store them by value. I'm sorry, I, let me back up. I said I, they're stored by R value reference. They're not, they're stored actually by value. So they're passed by with move semantics and by R value reference. Okay, so if we, look at the L value case, um, because I put this all in the same project, I have to call the class something different than Apollo um, to distinguish it. And so I just call it Apollo ref. Um, again, this is something that uh, you're all well versed in, so I don't need to go into it, but um, this is what I present to the students um, as one way of storing objects without taking the hit of object copy. In the R value case, our header looks like this. And so again, passed in by R value reference and move semantics stored by value, which is a lot better than the previous case. And although I haven't done any, um, maybe at some point I should benchmark it, but I don't think there's really any appreciable difference in the efficiency. Okay, so moving on, um, we take up the, the next task of composition with a polymorphic member object. And again, going back to um, the types of problems that I worked with in practice, this is a very common situation. And this again, even more than the, the previous case, um, could be um, a bit tricky. So again, I give them the example of passing by and storing as a const L value reference, but it's going to have the same limitations. Um, we can also pass by move, but instead of our value reference, we can use a unique pointer. So again, this gives us full control over lifetime of the member variable, and it replaces the old clone methods that you may remember with raw pointers um, that ultimately did require object copy if you wanted to have full control of the contained member. In addition, it's blessed by Struestrup in his um, tour of C++ book. And as I recall, we had a, I, sorry, I don't remember his name, but he's from Google and he 
presented the Google coding standards to us at our, at our group meeting, I know about a year ago. And also this is in the, the Google, um, as I recall, it's in the Google coding standards to prefer unique pointer. Okay, so um, another fun little example, um, again, keeping with our space program theme, we're gonna go way back in history to the first manned space program in the US, the Mercury program. And this was, um, these were missions with a single astronaut, which comprised, which was comprised of a capsule and a booster rocket. And, but there were two types of missions. First, there was the smaller Redstone rocket, which was just for the first up and down missions. But then starting with John Glenn's mission, um, the, um, the mission was to orbit the Earth, so the booster rocket had to have more power. So if we, again, look at our containing class as a Mercury mission, it's going to have a capsule. Uh, we can also give it the name of the astronaut. And it's going to have a booster rocket, but the booster rocket is polymorphic. So it's a polymorphic member. So we get a UML diagram that looks something like this. Um, <clears throat> I do, this actually should just say Mercury. When I originally um, constructed this example, I had pointer versus reference, but um, what this means is a Mercury, um, Mercury mission with unique pointers or a unique, unique pointer representing the booster rocket member. And if we look at the header header file, it looks something like this. So we're passing in by unique pointer to a booster rocket um, abstract base class. And then it is stored as such down here. Again, keeping with the just-in-time philosophy, I also introduced the rule of five. And so because this is a unique pointer, we we're not able to copy a unique pointer, so we disable the um, the copy op the default copy operations. But it is movable, so we just use the default move operations. And then, because it's rule five, we put a default destructor here. Okay, um, moving along, week five, we get into STL containers. And so I start out with a general introduction to templates, uh, both template functions and classes, um, and explain what a template is, how they work, and so forth. But then this motivates the discussion of STL containers. And as usual, we're going to discuss the sequential and the associative containers. Um, but we mainly stick with stood vector. This is going to be our sequential container of choice. And again, it's um, in line with best practices. The, you know, as we're always taught, use vector by default, <clears throat> or when in doubt, use a vector. And for quantitative applications, it works just fine. And for what we need, it's going to be the most efficient container. Um, <clears throat> By doing this, though, by just sticking with vector, I do an in-depth coverage of the member functions on vector, but because so many are common with the other containers, by learning how to use vector very well and understand the member functions, then if they were in a situation where they might need deck or list, um, all of that would transfer over very easily. Um, I also talk about pushback versus in placeback again. Um, in order to avoid object copy. As for associative containers, we mainly stick with map because these can be very convenient for handling data input coming into a model and reporting out the results. And the way that this works is using enum constants as the key types. Um, and this way, um, for example, in, in finance, if you're pricing an option, you're you're going to have the price of the option. So that would be 
one element in a map and you could have a an enum um an enum with the name price if i mean say it'd be an element of an enum i should say so you could have price and then the the greek risk values for example delta gamma vega theta and rho so all these can be spelled out as um they can be visible as words but they're just representing an integer type which serves as our indexed um, our index key in the map um, these are usually very small you know we're not talking about a map with a massive number of elements so we're not too concerned about efficiency here if they in other applications such as um, data science then um, where you're dealing with very large data sets and if you were to put them into some sort of an associative container then you might want to start talking about hash tables okay we then um, discuss stl iterators and iterator based for loops although we don't use them a whole lot after this point but um, on occasion if they're needed, we have them available. Um, and we also introduce range-based for loops, which we do stick to pretty much from this point through the end of the course. Okay. All right, so um, then we move into STL algorithms. Um, at the start, we focus on the two big ones for each and transform and so students get to know these fairly well we then introduce algorithms in the numeric header file because again we're dealing with mathematical types of problems and so we want to have um, algorithms um, such as accumulate and um, inner product because those are used quite a bit. The first one mainly for calculating means, and the second one, of course, for calculating dot products. Um, and then we go back to um, more of the algorithms in the algorithm header. And um, I introduce a few, and then I might give one or two that they haven't seen before um, to work on in an assignment. But the, the key here is to show students that we can use these to avoid loops, and including the calculations of means and dot products. And so the assignments will specifically say no for loops. You must do these with STL algorithms. Also introduce lambda expressions, which are also, of course, very convenient for math and can serve as auxiliary functions in STL algorithms along with functors. So again, that, um, at, from this point on, then we use lambda expressions quite a bit, but it's also one of the reasons that I stressed functors so much is because they can be used in STL algorithms. One more thing that I introduce here, um, really just because I didn't know where else to put it, is exceptions. By week seven, we move more into what I consider numerical C++, um, in particular, random number generation from um, a number of different distributions that are defined in the random header. Um, as you may know, when working with um, random number generation in the uh, standard library, you need an engine first to generate um, uniformly distributed integers. But we pretty much stick to the Mersenne Twister 64-bit engine because it's the best available. And again, at least in the quant finance practice, it's typically preferred. What's really nice here um, and I mentioned then for the distributions, we mainly use uh, the uniform distribution could be over a um, set of real numbers from zero to one, or it could be a set of integers. Um, the normal distribution, which is critical for, again, in finance for no arbitrage pricing theory. Um, but in 
just about any other branch of science, normal distribution is going to be widely used. And the student's T distribution as an alternative is a normal if we need to fit data with fat tails. Okay, but one thing that I also tell the students is, again, before C++11, we had to do all of this from scratch. And so no matter which company I went to, it was at three different companies where we use this. Each time, the first thing I had to do was code this up from scratch and find a Mersenne twist, the yeah, Mersenne twister algorithm open source somewhere, use that, and then um, program the the uniform um, uniform distribution and then the transformation to a normal distribution. So all of that now we have in modern C++ and we can get on with the job in about 10 minutes. Whereas before it was a case of about anywhere from two to four weeks to get everything um, designed, coded and tested. So again, modern C++ is um, such a boon for scientific programming. We also talk about parallel STL algorithms from C++ 17. So um, again, a very, um, very useful new feature. Um, okay, we also at this stage talk about task-based concurrency and you may recall uh, for those of you who attended my talk the last time that I talked about this a bit and also at my, uh, the related talk that I did at CPPCon. Um, so I won't go into the details here, of course, um, and a lot of you know this already, but um, they're, so I, I introduced them, I talk about the difference between concurrency and parallelism. And now I know that both in, so from some of the speakers we've had talk in our group here, and also some of the comments I got at CPPCon that, a lot of people don't look like stood async and it gets a bad rap, but for the type of work that quantitative programmers do, the performance improvement is fantastic considering how easy and foolproof it is to use. Um, I did give an example at CPPCon of some, um, an option pricing model that used Monte Carlo scenarios. And on a 20 processor virtual server, I was able to get over 90% cut in runtime. Somebody made the comment, well, with you should be able to do better with Amdahl's law. Okay, that's probably true. But to get that, to get to that 95% point, you're probably gonna have to do um, the proverbial 80% more work to get there. But for a lot of work in scientific computing where, you know, for example, you might be using Python, but you, you need the performance of C++. You can do this, get up and running very quickly and realize um, very significant improvements in efficiency. I should also point out that nowadays a, a 20 processor virtual server on the cloud is very common. So, um, it's it's should be very easy for someone to spin up a um, a nice big server on the cloud and just go to town. And um, you may recall that um, this plot of Monte Carlo um, simulations from uh, from last time, but it allows us to do things like this and in parallel. And that's this is the example on which this. Um, this result is based. Okay, now another fun little assignment um, that um, students do, um, I, I do this not every year, but some years, um, is I give them a problem to try out the uh, random number generation in C++. And what I do is I use the Monty Hall paradox from Let's Make a Deal. Um, now, I'm among C++ developers, so 
most of you are of an age that you remember Monty Hall and let's make a deal, but some of you might not. Um, but the way it works is this, this is a game show. And one of the contests is there would be three doors, one through three and Monty Hall, the host would pick a contestant from the crowd. And you can see there, they're dressed up in cowboy hats and other costumes. So to attract his attention, to get him to pick them. But anyway, so a contestant is picked and behind one of the doors would be the grand prize, such as a new car. And then behind the other two doors would be zonk prizes. So in other words, you lose, there'd be something like a goat. Okay, so the Monty Hall paradox goes like this. It's a, essentially a math problem. So if the contestant were to make a choice, say door, door number one, then Monty would have one of the other doors opened, for example, door number three revealing the goat. So it's not the grand prize. He would then ask the contestant, whether he or she would like to switch the choice to the remaining door. So in this case, door number two. So the paradox is, if you were given the chance to switch, should you? And it turns out the answer is yes. And in order to show this using a bunch of simulations, the assignment is to implement or to construct a uniform distribution on the integers one through three which we can do using the random header. And with that, then they can, they can go through the case where the contestant does not switch and where the contestant does switch and, and then check the numbers and see that the contestant will be about, uh, it would be about twice more likely to win the grand prize by switching the choice. I'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, within in the context of a, a follow-up example. Okay, week eight, we introduce matrix algebra library. And for this, I use the um, open source Eigen library. Um, it's templated and header only, which makes it very easy to put inside a project. Um, we concentrate mainly on two types of objects in this library, they're dynamic uh, matrix and a dynamic vector called matrix XD and vector XD where the little D stands for double. Um, so all of the standard matrix and vector operations are supported and even cooler is these are STL compli um, compliant. It The library also um, provides a lot of the common decompositions of matrices, which are very often used in quantitative work. So for example, the uh, lower upper triangular decomposition, uh, the Kolaski decomposition and singular value decomposition. Now, um, it was a choice that to use Eigen, there are a number of different linear algebra libraries out there, but Eigen has kind of attained a critical mass status now and it's very popular and also in some of the shootout competitions with the other libraries it usually comes in at or very close to the top so some of the things that we look at some examples and exercises that we may look at first of all would be solving the system of linear equations which uses the lu decomposition um, generating correlated random scenarios, which involves using the Koleski decomposition and Monte Carlo. So they're able to take what they just learned with random as, um, and to some extent, they could also parallelize these operations uh, to generate correlated random scenarios. And uh, one more that I sometimes assign is calculation of linear regression coefficients using the singular value decomposition. And there's one more from finance, um, which is called rolling window predictions of portfolio returns. And this involves um, matrix, um, um, some matrix algebra and, um, and then on a, um, 
a rolling basis calculating a dot product. Okay, but again, you know, my examples are finance, but most of these could certainly be applicable for just about any other applied science course because they're so widely used in so many different areas of science and engineering. Okay. Um, in week eight, we also talk about um, math-related components in the Boost libraries. Again, if you were at my uh, previous talk, um, you may recall some of these. So one of the libraries is the Boost Math Toolkit, which includes things such as uh, probability distributions. Now, these are different than what's in the standard. In the standard, they are um, distributions from which we draw random numbers. In Boost, what they provide are the cumulative distribution function, the prob probability density function, and the quantile function for um, I can't remember how many, but a large number of distributions. There's also numerical integration, which is um, very useful, very easy to use, along with root solving, which is r reasonably easy to use. With both of these, you can represent the function that either you want to integrate or find a root for as either a functor or a lambda expression. So again, that theme that I'd already covered before. There's also a library called Circular Buffers, which can be useful for handling time series data and, and live data feeds. Uh, and these are also STL compliant. And so an assignment that I give sometimes is to implement what's called the EGARCH time series model. And in terms of finance, um, this is a simulation of market volatility. And so they place the, it as, each new value is generated, is placed in the circular buffer until the buffer fills up. And then the next new one comes in and it kicks out the, the oldest data point and pushes on the new data point. Um, and then in order to do this, because the randomness again is dictated by the normal distribution. So they also again use the random number distribution in the standard library. Week nine, if in, in our course, we start covering um, a very big topic in finance, which is options pricing. So we're gonna, it's kind of a confluence of a lot of the topics that we've already covered. And then we're gonna use these to code up realistic examples. And in our case, we use them to price financial option contracts, as well as the, what are called the Greek values, which are essentially um, various derivatives with respect to um, parameters that go into the, um, into the pricing formula. Um, however, if this were some other area of science or engineering, this would be the place where the instructor could take, say, biology or chemistry or physics or um, you know, whatever the, the topic is. And now look at domain specific kind of real world examples and use what has been covered up until now and put it all together. So, but in our case, what we do is we first cover closed form formulas such as those derived from the Black-Scholes formula. Um, this includes European options, single barrier options. And um, one thing I sometimes cover, I didn't cover it this year, um, was calculating the implied volatility. And here we could use boost root finding. Um, I'm teaching the, the an advanced course this summer, so I'll probably cover it there instead this year. Um, we also use the um, probability distributions in boost. So in particular, the standard normal CDF, and so then we can do fun things with option prices. Um, we also talk about Monte Carlo option pricing. Um, again, the, my last talk, I covered this in a little more detail, but um, these are mainly for models where no closed form solution exists. But we first look at the cases where they do exist, so we have a way of comparing our results. So we use the same, the European options and single barrier options. And so the, the concepts that we use here 
among others, but the, the main ones are um, projection of asset price simulations using random. So going back to that Jimi Hendrix album cover um, looking diagram that I showed you earlier, um, you get a lot of um, simulated price paths for a particular asset. And then the option price depends on the movement of that asset price. Um, we also generate these using std async and std future. We also use STL algorithms, including parallel algorithms, to replace loops. And then again, that allows you to do things like what you see there, or you're generating the individual paths. And in the case of a European option, you're looking at the payoffs here at the end and discounting them back to time zero taking the average, which gives you the price. We also um, compute the risk values numerically as well. So that means we um, perturb the, um, the whatever the parameter is a little bit, say by 1%, and then calculate the option again, but reusing the code. So all we have to do is, is reuse the code that we have. We just perturb that parameter run it again, and then we take the difference and um, divide it to get an approximated derivative. And this is all based on this um, stochastic process you see here, where at each step, um, we are drawing a standard random normal um, epsilon sub t here. Um, the, the sigma here stands for the volatility of the underlying asset. Uh, delta t is the the time step increment length, R is the, and uh, R is the risk-free rate of interest. And these these are the the previous stock price that's generated, and then that gets the next step here. Okay, so now in in week ten, um, this is I often reserve the last week for special topics, but a big one. Um, that I often cover is um, integrating the R language with C++. And so we talk about a package that's available in R, it involves a little more setup though compared to a regular R package, um, that provides interfaces to um, C++. So it could be I'll talk about it in a little bit, but it could be anywhere from just simple one-off code all the way up to a reusable library. Um, this was developed by a guy by the name of Dirk Edelbutel, who's in, he's a quant in Chicago. He's now on the faculty at University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, which as many of you may recall, is where the HAL 9000 computer was designed. Um, there are some, Additional packages that can be used with it. One is RCPP Eigen, which allows one to use Eigen in the C++ code. And another that I cover called BH stands for boost headers. So if you're, if all you're using in boost are from the boost headers, which is really all that we use, then we can um, use these in C++ code that is called from R. And so, what this allows is um, interfacing to, first of all, as I said, one-off, excuse me, C++ code that can be a faster alternative to R. R is great. It has a, many different mathematical functions and a large number of open source packages but it is an interpreted language. So there are cases where it's going to be a lot slower, especially if there's any kind of iteration going on. Um, but we can go from that extreme all the way to taking a reusable um, set of C++ code or even libraries. And it allows um, calling C++, but for just regular R users, they don't, they don't have to care about it because as far as they're concerned, all they're doing is calling an R function, which behind the scene is calling C++. And so um, what this also allows is 
using a lot of the powerful visualization capabilities available in R. I think R is is well known for is it, a lot of different um, plotting and graphing capabilities. So there's there are those that are built into the R language, but there are got to be on the order of hundreds of other graphing packages. And so these can all be used inside R and it doesn't care because it just gets the results from C++, brings them back into R, and then you just deal with your results as you would in a normal R session. So looking at an example, well, first of all, uh, another thing that I, I talk about is uh, stressing the concept of reusable code. And so not only in the context of R, but in general, um, I talk about this in the class, in that we could have an independent and say a specialized applied C++ library. So it's just standing there. It's only C++ and that's it. It is probably going to use the C++ standard library. It may use other open source libraries, um, such as Boost, Eigen, and, and others. Then with RCPP, it provides an interface to this library. And that means we can interface with an R session, as you see, and so over here, this is just standard R code. Um, if you want to write a C++ um, function or class, you can also do this inside what's called RStudio. It's the most popular IDE for R. And by installing, R, installing RCPP, you can actually code and compile C++ code inside um, the R Studio IDE. But again, the R side doesn't care about it. Once that's compiled and the interface is set up, then over here in R, um, the user, which is more often than not going to be someone who's not familiar with C++, but the user doesn't have to care. And then in addition, as I mentioned before, there are thousands upon thousands of open source R packages that are stored on what's called the CRAN repository. <clears throat> and um, there are certain standards that need to be met in order to be uh, listed on that, um, in that repository. But again, we have the power of C++ here, the convenience of R, and then we can use any other R package that we want here with the, the results that we get back from our C++ code or library. As an example, let's go back to the Monty Hall paradox. So if we look at <clears throat> first the R code, what this is going to do is it's going to call a function called Monty Hall paradox, which actually exists in C++. By using this tag, you see RCPP export. What this does is it says, expose this function in an R session. So the, the function name is exactly the same and the arguments are exactly the same. And then the results, um, the, the results are stored in a vector and then passed back to an R vector object, which you see here, which is PDX. And again, RCPP allows you to do this. You don't have to do anything extra. It knows that a, um, an, a stood vector in C++ will map to a standard vector object in R. And then, then the results um, are used down in as you see down here, where we are actually going to plot out the results. The, this is plot, uh, Plotly, which is a um, very powerful plotting package in R. And so you can get very nice um, representations like what you see here. But again, um, well, RCPP can be a little tricky at first, but once you get it, um, it's mostly straightforward to use. and um, again, we have now the best of both worlds with C++ and R ultimately allowing you to um, present your results in uh, very nice 
plots and graphs and so forth. Okay, so um, just to summarize, um, so at the end of this course, so it's um, students will be able to program in modern C++. And again, I, I, you know, I, as I mentioned, I've seen other classes that compete with our program. I don't want to sound like I'm great. They're not. That's not my point. My point is, is that so many other programs, they still are not covering modern C++. And this covers, this, this comes from what I've seen on other syllabi and moreover students who come into our program from undergraduate uh, courses. And um, I'm just, I'm just stunned by what I hear. But anyway, um, they know how to use and program in uh, object oriented code. Um, they can write efficient iterative code now with STL algorithms and avoid loops. Um, they know how to generate random numbers from a wide number of probability distributions. Um, they also have probability functions in Boost. They can program st standard numerical methods. These are actually really good exercises um, for using new concepts that are introduced in the course. You saw the one example of root finding, but you take a standard numerical analysis course and um, it's a uh, I guess you could call it a target rich environment from which to choose um, examples and assignment problems. You can also write parallelized code um, very easily with stood async and stood future. Again, we covered the case. I know that many people out there gripe about it, but for this purpose, it works well. And going forward, there are new versions of the standard that are being developed that will expand on it and um, will um, be tightening it up a bit more. But for our purposes, it works really well. Um, matrix algebra and decompositions, regression models, and writing reusable library code that can be interfaced with um, commonly used languages such as R or Python, uh, Julia and others. Um, and so they're able to actually now by the end of the course, they should be able to actually start writing real world scientific applications that are faster than Python, but really I don't think are that much more difficult to write. And they can do this without ever needing char stars, new and delete, dynamic C arrays, um, implementation of their own doubly linked list, coding their own binary searches, um, dealing with manual thread management or an external threading library. And so this also means that students are encouraged rather than discouraged. And um, I think one of the reasons that students get discouraged is they get a lot of this legacy stuff piled up on them and they're in a in a situation where they can't see the forest for the trees. So um, I feel that they're a lot more encouraged by using modern C++ and using these new features rather than having to reinvent the wheel on their own. And so um, this also makes C++ a more attractive go-to language for programming scientific and mathematical applications. Okay, so that's it. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, if you'd like to reach me, this is my email address. And what I will do, I haven't done it yet, but I'll get the sample code out on my um, GitHub site and we'll put it on the um, on the uh, user the Northwest uh, Users Group webpage so you can have access to it. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Mm, thanks, Lloyd. Thanks, so, if there any if, yeah, if there are any questions, I can take them. Do you ever teach Kant Express? That's a powerful tool to pre-compute. Uh, uh, oh, Const Expert. Yeah. Um, that would be in our in the advanced course. Okay. I might. I mean, at. Um, 
there is a, I can't remember there, I think there might be a case where we have to use it because some compilers require it for certain things in the first course, but I can't remember if it, um, it, it was that or it was no accept. I, I think it was no accept though. Yeah, you could do um, no accept, yeah, that would speed up a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. But at, at this stage, I don't, you know, that would, I think, be better for an advanced course because I, I think they have a, a give, there's enough on their plate here. Just my own opinion, but if you think differently, uh, certainly would consider it. I, I think you can touch on those. I know that the gaming group, uh, especially like um, the, the user group or that user group, um, SG14 was getting into no accept heavily as well as const expert. So, okay, well, I'll, I'll think about that. I, I certainly do cover, um, I, I do cover them in the in the advanced class, um, but I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah, and, thanks. And I think that they're moving away. I mean, the focus of the C is to move away from class-based programming, object-oriented programming. Right. So uh, I would try to also incorporate like Lambda, stuff like that. But maybe that's, that would be like, if you're really interested, go to my next course, <laughs> advanced course. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, wait, you, you say Lambda, you mean Lambda expressions? Yes. We use those, we actually use those a lot in this, okay. in this class, yeah, because they're so nice for math. Okay. They're, they're, they're pretty amazing. Yeah. Do the students find the for loops easier than, say, writing, uh, you know, something with a name that says do this, that takes, you know, a, a pair of iterators? Um, I've not asked them. Um, okay. I, I just wonder, I, like, uh, you, you mentioned that it was heavily for loop based. And I found that, you know, like, I, I like because then when I'm reading the code, it'll be you'll see you know just you know I'm doing this. I'm not going into the details of it and or even I guess the for loop within uh, within a function too. Yeah, well, so, in, well, I can say uh, from experience, um, especially when you get into um, th with with Monte Carlo type work or. Um, there's a, another type of method for option pricing called lattices, and you can have a loop inside a loop inside a loop. And the indices are j jumping all over, aren't they? Yeah, and so so what I what I show them is first how to use lambda expressions to help avoid that. I mean, there might be there might be nested loops, but the they can by organizing what you know the the math or the processing that's going on they can see that in inside a lambda and then rather than have it all jumbled into one big nested yeah. for loop so it's and, logically broken up within in yeah the, so you're not, yeah uh, throwing a super nested loop at the set of loops at them yeah and then and then the other thing too is then later then we cover stl algorithms which can help avoid loops as well i might have a couple a few of my students online now i um anyone care to jump in on that question no okay no, i was interested in because you know learning it is different than doing it for you know how many years and you, you know it, where it's a you nice know, iterative organic process but you know throwing at someone i i just was really interested in how they would perceive the differences. Okay. I mean, my experience is they, they picked it up pretty well. Okay. And the SQL, yeah, like writing your own SQL algorithm type thing for whatever you're doing is kind of what I was getting at. Oh, for that. No, we, we just, we use what, what's available in the, in the library. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, when, in, when, in when that's not library. available, but with that, that style of, that style of functions is what I meant. Oh, I see. Okay, um, that's something I'll probably cover in the advanced course. But for, okay. but for most of the, you know, the types of models that we work with, we really don't need anything besides what's in the standard. 
Okay. Just again, it's just from experience. So. It's pretty. It's pretty um, in, um, wow, it's midnight here. Sorry, uh, it, it's pretty com- comprehensive. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Not a question, but comments. If people didn't know it was there, there's a little chat stream going on on the side of this i've posted several links to different videos which were referenced at different points uh john callab's the beast is back when he presented oh, good. That, uh about a year, two years ago year and a half uh also a cpp con video by patrice roy uh c plus plus as a first language oh that was um that was just uh last year right yes yeah that and was we- really good yeah, and it was repeated on uh, posted online here just about a week ago. Also, oh, you referenced uh, Chandler Cruz, uh, or Curtis, uh talk that he did with us a year and a half ago or so, and it was taught. There's a link for that there at the CPP at NWCPP org. Um, Wait, which one was his, that? His talk was understanding compiler optimizations. He's a guy oh. from Google. And I, I don't oh. remember him talking about the Google coding standards, but he might have referenced it a little bit. Yeah, I, I remember I remember he covered it. Um, okay. Yeah. I also included the link to uh, LinkedIn's uh, CPPCon page. Okay, good. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Well, Dan, if, if you get the, oh Dan, if you get the links and stuff to me, I'll get those posted. Uh, Robin, um, you're going to process or switch the video over, correct? Uh, video is still being recorded. Do you want me to stop recording? Yeah, we can stop recording at this point. <laughs> okay. if, right. if there are no more questions, is, is there are there any other questions? Last call for alcohol. <laughs> Sorry. I still got a quarter glass. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. If, <laughs> if right. there are no more questions, then I stop recording the video. Just All right. a second, please. All right. Thanks, everybody. I, I stop recording. Three, two, one, done. <coughs>